During the 1950s, Franco Modigliani and Martin Miller conceptualized and developed this theorem and wrote The Cost of Capital, Corporation Finance and Theory of Investment that was published in the American Economic Review in the late 1950s. The MM approach can be broadly discussed in two parts. Case 1. Proposition without taxes The MM approach advocates the irrelevancy of the capital structure. It commends the value of the firm is not dependent on the choice of the capital structure. Rather, it is affected by the operating income. Risk involved in investment and this approach assumes that there are no corporate taxes, transaction cost does not exist. The perfect capital market is prevalent and there is no flotation cost. Under the MM approach, the value of the firm is equated with a pi, also being tabularly represented in the form of a balance sheet. And it can be seen that the value of the firm is not affected by the debt or equity presence. Let whatever be the composition of debt or equity, what is important is the value of the firm, which is the value of the pie chart, amounting to rupees 1 lakh. Being unaffected by the presence of debt or equity, so this is the fundamental substance to the approach. The MM approach says that the value of the levered firm is equal to the value of the unlevered firm. The levered firm has debt, whereas the unlevered firm has only equity. Two firms that are alike in every aspect except the capital structure must have the same market value. Otherwise, arbitrage is possible. Arbitrage means two assets that are essentially the same and buying the less expensive while selling the more expensive. Let us take an example. It is a case where the value of the levered firm is more than the value of the unlevered firm. The MM approach says that when such is the case, there will be an arbitrage process wherein the value of the levered firm will come down and the value of the unlevered firm will go up and there will be an even point. In the given example, we have firm X that is unlevered and firm Y that is a levered firm having a debt of rupees 1 lakh at 7%. Jotting down the key information, it is noted that the EPIT of both firms X and Y is rupees 40,000. The debt component is present only in firm Y, that is 1 lakh rupees. Both firms have the same cost of equity at 20%, and the cost of debt applicable to only firm Y is at 7%. Let us find the value of equity denoted by the letter S that is calculated by subtracting interest from earnings before interest and tax and dividing the same by the cost of equity. Firm X having no debt will not have any interest payable. Therefore, its value of equity amounts to rupees 2 lakhs. On doing the set calculation, the value of equity of firm Y amounts to Rs. 1,65,000. Moving on, we calculate the value of the firm. The value of the firm is equal to the value of equity and the value of debt. Firm X having zero debt equates the value of equity to the value of the firm at Rs. 2 lakhs which firm Y having debt component value of firm equals rupees 2,65,000. When we look at this now, the value of the levered firm is higher than the value of the unlevered firm. This is what is argued in the MM approach that the value of the levered firm is high because of the capital structure, but there is nothing like that because it can come down and the value of the unlevered firm can also go up. 
because of an arbitrage process. So let's understand the arbitrage process. Let's say you're holding 10% shares in firm Y, the levered company. It means 10% on 1,65,000 rupees. That is, you'll be having an investment of 16,500. Now this investment will fetch a 10% return on being invested. Return on profit, rupees 40,000 minus rupees 7,000, that is rupees 33,000. 10% 10 of 33,000 is rupees 3,300 is the return for having shares in by the levered company. In our example, by the levered company had high value whereas the unlevered company had low value. Now to test this arbitrage process, let us see. Let's see this 10% investor who is holding 16,500 rupees at its market value is going to sell in the market and realize rupees 16,500. Now he should borrow 10,000 rupees to acquire a 10% let at 7%. So the total resources available with this investor now is rupees 10,000 that is borrowed and 16,500 rupees the realized stake. So with 26,500 rupees he should invest in X for a 10% stake which is 10% of 2 lakhs that being 20,000. Now this 20,000 rupees yields a 10% return on profit amounting to rupees 4,000. But this 20,000 investment had not come free because he had borrowed 10,000 rupees, this bearing a cost of 7% on rupees 10,000 amounting to rupees 700. Here the return is 4,000 and cost is 700 rupees. So the net return is 3,300 rupees. Now this return is as same as the return that was earned in Y. Apart from that, there is also a surplus of 6,500. Well, how did a surplus arrive? It is rupees 26,500 minus 20,000. So by moving from Y to X, the investor's position has improved. Understanding the working of the arbitrage process, the value of the firm because of debt and equity component is not affected. Let's move on to study case 2, the MM approach considering taxes. The proposition 2 is based on the net income approach, hence it is called the theory of relevance. Modi Glani and Miller state that the optimal capital structure can be achieved by maximizing debt in the capital structure of a firm recognizing the relevance of corporate taxes. The principle of the theory includes the value of the firm will increase and the overall cost of capital of the firm will decrease with the increase in use of debt on account of deductibility of interest charges for tax purpose. Interest on debt is tax deductible. So when a firm adds debt to its capital structure, it lines up reducing its taxes. When taxes are reduced, you happen to increase cash flow through resulting in a reduction of net income because you are paying money to the government, but you are going to increase the cash flow. So let's look back at the example we refer to in case one, but with a tax rate of 30%. Here we have the case of the unlevered firm X and a levered firm Y, both having an EBIT of rupees 40,000. In firm X, there is no interest, so taxable income is EBIT, assuming taxes to be at 30%, that is 12,000 rupees, so net income is 28,000 rupees. Now looking at the levered firm, on deducting interest from EBIT, the taxable income amounts to rupees 33,000 and on further deducting tax of rupees 9,900, the net income equates to rupees 
23,100. Assuming that there is no depreciation, cash flow from assets is calculated by deducting taxes from EBIT with firm X having rupees 28,000 and firm Y having rupees 30,100. Rupees 2,100 is the excess cash flow that comes from what we call the interest tax shield. Moving ahead, we calculate the value of firms X and Y. X being the unlevered firm, its value is calculated by dividing EBIT with cost of equity and multiplying the entire thing with 1 minus tax rate to get Rs. 1,40,000. While the value of the levered firm Y is the sum of the value of the unlevered firm and the discounted present value of tax savings amounting to Rs. 1,42,100. From this illustration, it is clear that the value of the levered firm is more than the value of the unlevered firm and it is more by the tax shield. Graphically, what we have here is the case where there is no debt, the unlevered firm. Along the x-axis is, is the total debt being used. The pink line shows that the value of the firm does not change because of no debt is used, so it always remains the same. On the other hand, if debt is chosen, the value of the levered firm is going to be equal to the value of the unlevered firm, plus the tax shield. Here, a firm uses more debt actually winds up increasing the value of the firm. If there are corporate taxes and if the interest expense is tax deductible, remember, we do not assume any bankruptcy cost. So using more debt doesn't increase the risk of bankruptcy. Hoping that this visual clip was insightful. Thank you for watching.